in the extended family that are present, you can come with to support them. All the grandparents would like you to come on both sides and come stand with your grandchildren as well. This is a great day we celebrate. Would you please clap your hands as they will come down? Amen. The scriptures declare, be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> so we trust they won't stop. It'll keep on coming. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm sure it's a, uh, a great occasion and a really a happy day for you guys. I want to say this morning that uh, to the grandparents and parents, of course, this is a special day and we celebrate this day with you. I want to read the following scripture to you. Uh, then they were brought unto him little children that he may put his hands on them and pray and the disciples rebuke them. But Jesus said, suffer the little children, prevent them not to come unto me for such is the kingdom of God or heaven. And it says, verily I say unto you, whoever will not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms and he laid his hands on them and blessed them. So this morning, this is our attitude of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Heavenly Father, towards children. Children have a special place in his heart. And that is recorded in the scriptures that I just read to you. I want to say to um, your parents, to admonish you and encourage you, that you will teach all of your babies early the fear of the Lord and that you'll watch over their education and that you will ensure, uh, and this is almost a charge, that you will ensure that they will not go astray but that they will serve the Lord all the days of their life. You will direct their youthful mind and their scriptures to the place of worship. That is so important. We kind of cannot expect our children just automatically to love God. And we can't wait till they're 16 and 18 when they led astray. We must teach them from young to love the Lord, to love the Lord's house, to love the scriptures dearly. To restrain them, this is very important, to restrain the young children from evil associates and habits as much as in you lies to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. That means it's our responsibility as parents, grandparents, and the extended family to bring them up like that. Now, I want to ask the parents the following question, and you'll have to answer with a loud yes or a no. Will you endeavor to do so? Can I hear you again? Yes, yes I will. Now, remember, it's not a promise to pastor. It is a promise to the Lord and in the presence of the Lord. I'd like the congregation, please, to stand to their feet as we about to dedicate all of these wonderful children. I'd like all the pastors, please, to help me and take one child in your hand. And that'll, yeah. Praise God. Oh, the babies are beautiful. Look at that. And they're yawning. <laughs> now, please, I want to encourage you, don't fall asleep when I'm preaching. <laughs> All right. Look at them. <laughs> Father, in the name, please reach, stretch forth your right hand. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I pray, Lord, for these young babies, Lord, for these children that you have given us. And Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, as I lay my hands upon them, I bless them in Jesus' name. I bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. I break every curse, yes. every hindrance, Lord of oh God. I reverse every generational curse over their lives. And in the mighty name of Jesus, we pray the blessings of the Lord. We dedicate them, Lord, unto you. We dedicate them unto the Lord. And we pray, Father, that you have a special purpose for them. And as they will grow, Lord, you will direct them with the purpose, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that today, as we plead the blood of Jesus on the crown of the head to the soles of the feet, I declare they are blessed, that the angels of the Lord are on them, Lord. Thank you, Father, that these will be great, O Lord, people in the Lord, great Lord people, O God, that will grow up knowing the Lord. They'll have a voice in the nation 
in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I thank you and call it done. As we dedicate them to you, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, your hand will be upon them. No premature death, oh God, no poverty. We cancel the spirit of poverty. We declare they'll be enriched, Lord, wealthy, Lord, blessed and healthy in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen, amen and amen and amen. Now, I'd like the parents and grandparents, please, please remain standing to turn around, face the congregation. And ladies and gentlemen, we present to you, help me with the names so that I don't pronounce them incorrectly. It's Madison and Tay. We present to you Madison and Tay, and we encourage you in the Lord to receive them as members of the congregation. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen and amen. They, she, she's beautifully, yeah. <laughs> amen and amen. Congratulations, everybody. Congratulations. Bless the Lord. Congratulations, scene. Please clap your hands for them. Congratulations, Lucia. Praise God. Congratulations. Sorry. Congratulations. Amen. Alice, congratulations. Don't run away. Alice is running away. Alice has now got four. Amen. Bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God is good. Good morning, everybody. Let me try that again. Good morning, everybody. Are you ready for the word of God? Amen. Say, I'm ready. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus, we commit to you the preaching of your word. And I pray, Father, you would anoint my mind, anoint my thinking, Lord of God, that I would speak as the oracles of God. I pray, Lord of God, that as I preach and teach the word of God, Father, there'll be no hindrance from any satanic maneuverment, Lord of God, and harassment. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus. I declare, Lord of God, that everybody will hear the word of God, hide it in their hearts, Lord. Go out there and function in the ability of God. I pray, Lord of God, that you would lead them, guide them, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I cancel every hex, every spell, and everything, Lord, that will hinder the preaching of your word, Lord. These are your sheep, and I pray, Lord of oh God, that they will hear the voice of God in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said a loud amen, amen, and amen, and amen. Well, it's another great opportunity to share God's word with you. I'd like to read from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. I want to speak on the subject of solving life's problems. We deviated for the last two weeks but I want to get back on track and talk about solving life's problems. And the reason why I chose that as a topic to preach and to kind of teach on it is because we as Christians, we kind of bring a lot of heartache upon ourselves um, because we kind of malfunction with our day-to-day -day living. We say things too rashly. We, we act out of anger. And we get ourselves in knots and tangles. And eventually we kind of blame God for all of the things that we experience. But in my teaching on solving life's problems is to teach you how to navigate through life. To be intelligent, to make good decisions, and you don't get frustrated at the end of the day. So we're on the subject of improving your personality. So I'm going to finish that briefly, but to the tail end of my message, I'm going to speak about something very important. I'm going to touch briefly on improving your personality. But on the tail end, I'm going to speak about weaknesses and how to prevent your weaknesses. Now, I think that is important because if you know that and if you know how to navigate, you won't get into trouble. Ephesians, therefore, Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, your Lord, has forgiven you. So in speaking about improving your personality, we've touched already on the following. I said, number one, that you should be friendly. And the second point is that you should have a positive attitude. And number three is having respect for other people. Just mutual respect, giving respect, showing respect. And the fourth one I shared was integrity. And the fifth point was to be courteous and generous. The sixth point was having a good sense of humor. And the seventh point that I stopped three weeks ago was having a genuine interest in others. 
I want to now come to my eighth point, which is the ability to communicate. In other words, to know how to express yourself when you are speaking to people. You don't speak in a demeaning way. You don't speak in a disrespectful way. Even as a Christian, because whatever we sow, we will reap. So which means to say that we have to guard the way we speak. Guard the way that we interact with others. Guard the way and watch the way how we interact with people that are superiors or at a higher level at work. That you can't use the language as I'll speak my mind. It's okay if you take that stance and say I'll speak my mind. That's all right if you have a good mind. But if you don't have a good mind, then you should not speak your mind. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we have to be guarded how we speak to people that are on the same level as us and, of course, people that are at a higher level in us because it's going to determine your promotion at the end of the day. So remember that, the ability to communicate. The ninth point is tactfulness. Using wisdom when dealing with sensitive issues. There are some things that you should not say. There's some things that we should not repeat, even though we have knowledge of it. We should not repeat it to others because then we end up tail-bearing and causing dissension and strife. And God, the Bible says in, in the Word, in the Scriptures, He says He hates those things. The tenth point is humility, to be humble, never to have a spirit of pride. And that if you walk in humility, God gravitates towards people that are humble in heart. The Bible says that he pushes away from himself people that are proudful. God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. So remember that is that it's for you to walk in humility. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter your level of education. It's for you to walk humbly. Don't worry about the fact that you don't get don't force yourself to get accolades. Don't force yourself for people to applaud you. God will do that for you. God will open the doors for you. God will bring you to prominence. God will lift you up. Your job is to love God. Your job is to walk with humility. God's job is to lift you up and promote you. And he'll do that. The 11th point is to show some enthusiasm. Be a person of inspiration, enthusiasm, is a vital quality that will rouse you into action. Surround yourself with enthusiastic people. Remember this, that enthusiasm is contagious. So you've got to be enthusiastic with the things you do, about, with the things that you're busy with. The 12th point is proper attire. How you dress affects people's perception of you. People tend to treat you the way you are dressed. I promise you it works. I have dressed up very smart and went to the bank. And I dressed up with jeans and tackies and a loose t-shirt. And also went to the same bank, same set of tellers, different attitudes. When I dress smart, they call me sir. When I arrived just with jeans and tackies, they said, can we help you? <laughs> it's the truth. So the way you dress is very important. I know people may have different opinions about it. But the point is, listen, I think there's something about dressing smart. We dress smart on great occasions, at weddings, at birthdays, at functions. Why can't we dress smart in the house of the Lord? Why can't we dress smart? Say amen to that. The 13th point is stability. Stability is the ability to stand firm in what you believe, allowing the passions of life not to sway you to the left or to the right. Stability means mastering yourself. Stability means that you guide yourself. You tell yourself how to behave. You watch how you behave. It's taking control over your mouth, your faculties, your emotions. As Sia said the one day, he said that's what the world calls emotional intelligence. Not throwing tantrums. I like seeing sisters here this morning. I saw her walking up with her family, and uh, um, I met her when I went to Durban Christian Center and uh, when they had the tragedy there. But I remember her words. Uh, I didn't know exactly that was, you know, who, that, whether that was seen sister, but her face looked very familiar. So I greeted them, but this is the word she said. 
She said, oh, this is our home. Oh, this is our home. Stability means that you don't find yourself or find your feet everywhere. Stability means making church your home. I like the words that she spoke, and she's present here today. And that's what she echoed. She said, this is our home. This is our home. Talking about her church. And I thought to myself, and I wondered, I said, I wonder how many of our people that belong to this church say, this is our home. There are many churches, but there's only one place you can call home. There are many pastors, but there's only one that you can call my father. Say amen. amen. We love people. We love visiting with people. We love vacations. We love traveling overseas, if you do love traveling. But you know, there's something about going home. There's an excitement. You can travel everywhere. I remember my recent trip. We traveled to lovely places, awesome places. And I was enjoying myself, having great food, but when I got on the plane to come home, I said to my wife, oh, at last I'm going home. There's something about home, something about stability, about making your church your home, about being stable in your life. The fourth thing is self, the 14th point is self-control. Self-control is one of the most important qualities in life. Without self-control, you can easily hurt yourself and hurt others around you, both physically and emotionally. Sometimes there's times that you should not tackle an issue, should keep quiet. And sometimes it needs to be tackled. But self-control reveals your inner strength. Matthew 27, 12 says, when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. And so sometimes people <laughs> attack us as Christians, and we have this urgency to respond. And sometimes we do respond, causing more problems. And then there are other times we don't respond. Then people turn around and ask us, but why aren't you responding? There's your answer. That's why we don't respond, because he gave no answer. And sometimes we have to have the wisdom of the Lord not to answer our accusers. And the last point is self-confidence. Self-confidence is believing in yourself, that you're a child of God and that you will not allow anything or anybody to belittle you and belittle your dreams that you have in your heart. Having confidence in your abilities and developing a relationship with those that encourage you and build you up. When you come to church, that's what we do. We teach you the Word of God and together with teaching you the Word of God, we instill into you values, scriptural values, life's values to encourage you and build you up. The best way to build self-confidence is practice using it. So I encourage you this morning to have confidence in yourself. Now this is very important. I told you that the tail end of my message, I want to speak about things that was really going to help you. I want to speak to you now briefly in conclusion about recognizing your dominant weaknesses. Now we all kind of capitalize on strengths, but we never talk about weaknesses. Now, here's the issue. Having lived life for thus long and serving the Lord for a long time, I realized something, that everybody has strengths and everybody has weaknesses. But I realized that one way you can beat the enemy is by recognizing your dominant weakness. God anticipated every weakness. Psalm 78 verse 39 says, For he remembered that they were but flesh. A wind that passes away and comes not again. So one weakness can destroy you. Your refusal to recognize a weakness in your life guarantees your destruction. Recognition of your dominant weakness can save you thousands of nights of tears and, f and, and failure and devastation. Things that begin small can become huge. You cannot as an individual and as a Christian, refuse to recognize your dominant weakness. It will wreck every dream. It will sabotage every worthy relationship and ultimately make you a moment of disgrace on the earth. Now, here's some things that you should remember about your weaknesses. Not that you meditate on it, not that you make it larger in your life, but by knowing your weakness and knowing now that is my weak point. You avoid it. You steer away from it. Say amen to that. 
Number one, you must know that everybody has a weakness. The second point is that your heavenly Father is aware of your personal weaknesses. He's aware of it. It matters to him. He wants to give you strength to destroy every weakness. The third point is your weakness is the entry point for demonic spirits. Satan entered Judas. That's in John 13 verse 26. The fourth point is God will make every effort to reveal your weakness to you before it destroys you. Because God is for you, not against you. God wants you to succeed in life. Say amen to that. So he'll make every effort to reveal your weakness to you before it destroys you. And the Lord said to Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you like wheat. But Jesus said, he says, I have prayed that your strength will not fail you. The fifth point is somebody will be assigned by hell to feed and strengthen your weakness. As God assigns angels to help you and assigns people to help you to achieve your dreams, there's an assignment by hell to feed and strengthen your weakness. Delilah was an assignment by hell to destroy Samson, and it eventually destroyed him. That's found in Judges chapter 16, verse 4 and 5. The sixth point is your weakness will pursue, embrace, and seize any friendship that permits it, feeds on it, or enjoys it. A contentious spirit is one person that can infiltrate an entire church through those who allow it to exist unrebuked, unchecked, or uncorrected. Therefore, sometimes people don't understand why I do certain things. The Bible says, cast a scorner out. Strife will cease. I'd rather send someone out of my team, out of the house, than for him or her to destroy the whole team. The Bible says also, mark those that cause division amongst you. A person that causes division is a person that will ultimately destroy what you're trying to build. And so I just shared that with you for you to grab a hold of that. The seventh point is your weakness has an agenda, a plan to overtake your life and sabotage it. When lust has conceived, the Bible says it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. I'm quoting James chapter 1, verse 15. Your weakness, the eighth point, your weakness will bond you with the wrong people. So you've got to be careful of that. So having identified your weakness in your life, you don't have to come tell me about your weakness or tell your neighbor about your weakness. That's something private between you and God. But when you identify your weakness, you will must avoid people that will feed that weakness. Say amen to that. The ninth point, your weakness will separate you from the right people. Very important. Adam withdrew from God in the garden after he sinned. Your weakness makes you uncomfortable in the presence who refused to justify it. And I'm quoting Genesis chapter 3, uh, chapter 3 and verse 8. Adam withdrew from God in the garden after he sinned. It's amazing how when God wants to promote you, when God wants to take you over onto the other side, when God wants to bless you, he'll always assign a man or a woman to take you there. People say to me in my conversations often, says, no, I, just touch your neighbor and tell them not to sleep. Just touch your neighbor and tell them not to sleep, all right? This is important. It's going to help you. These are navigation tools to make yourself successful in life. It's amazing what I see from the stage up here. Amen. So... <laughs> I, I just can't imagine it. I'm giving you my best effort. I've prepared the whole week just for this one moment. And you come in church and you fall asleep. Or come and tell your neighbor, no, 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 no. It's not sleeping time. It's hearing time. <laughs> your weakness will separate you from the right people. Remember that. Remember that when God wants to take you higher, he'll connect you with people. People always say to me, in my conversations, casually, or even in a serious conversation, they say, oh, well, pastor, we don't need the church. We don't need a pastor. We just have a relationship with God. No, sir, that is incorrect. 
God gave man dominion over the earth. He put Adam and Eve on the earth. He gave them instructions with an assignment. Then it came, you know, the fall came. But Jesus restored us and brought us back to God. Man still has dominion on the earth. That is why authority is so important with God. And I'm telling you wives something. Whether you agree with your husbands or not, you should respect and honor them. Because in respecting and honoring them, there's authority. You cannot fight your husband from morning till night and expect God to bless you. All right, I, can, I think I should you know, get a louder amen on that. So he didn't say if you disagree with your husband, you can fight him. No, there's an authority with it. Children, you've got to obey your parents. There's power in authority. All right, just to throw this in, it does say husbands love your wives. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is that authority, God recognizes authority, and God has placed authority there for a reason. And if we want God to bless us, we must definitely recognize authority. The 10th point, your weakness can emerge at any time in your life, including your closing years. I always had this opinion, and I'm wrong. I was wrong, and I'm still wrong regarding that. I thought the older you get, the smarter you are. But I found some old people to be very, very, very stupid. And I found some young people to be very wise. I've then concluded that not all old people are wise. Say amen. amen. So chrono chronological age has nothing to do with the wisdom of God. The 11th point, your weakness cannot be overcome with humanism, human philosophy, and expla explanations of self-will power. If your weakness could be overcome by yourself, the blood of Jesus would not be necessary. The fact that you identify that you have a weakness, we can plead the blood and call upon the Lord to help us Amen. to overcome the weakness or guard that weakness. The 12th point, your weakness does not necessarily require a personal confession to everybody, but a recognition of it in the presence of God. That's important. The reason why David, God loved David so much, it's not that David was a perfect man. But David recognized when he made a mistake. David acknowledged his mistake. And God loved him for that. The 13th point is the easiest time to destroy your weakness is at the beginning stages. The 14th point is God will permit you to enjoy many victories even while your weakness is operating within you. He's long-suffering and he's merciful. He provides opportunity after opportunity for you to reach your final destination and for you to reach deliverance. The 15th point, those you love are waiting in the shadows for you to overcome and triumph over your weaknesses because their blessings are connected to you overcoming your weaknesses. The 16th point, and I'm almost done, is your weakness can be overcome by the word of God. Satan reacts to the word of God. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. Remember that. Remember that the word of God can help you. The word of God can cause you to overcome. And in conclusion, I want to say the following. Some things for you to remember as I conclude. What you fail to destroy will eventually destroy you. God told Saul to destroy all of the Malachites. He allowed, but he thought differently. He allowed King Agag to live. At Saul's bitter end, it was a young Amalekite warrior that killed him. So what he failed to destroy eventually destroyed him. What you are willing to walk away from determines what God will bring to you. Ruth walked away from Moab and she met Boaz. Judas refused to walk away from the money and he committed suicide. All men fall, but great ones get up again. Stop looking at what, where you have been and start looking at where you are going. You cannot correct what you are not willing to confront. 
crisis always occurs at the curve of change. Yeah. Anger is the birthplace for change. Yeah. When you become angry with something, don't feel, hmm, life is useless. It's not worth living. No, your anger is a birthplace for change. It's critical to remember that. Because what you're angry with, you will change. So anger is a birthplace for solutions. Struggle is a proof that you have not yet been conquered. Uh, come on, let me say that again. Your struggles is proof that you have not yet been conquered. You may say to me, but pastor, I'm a Christian and I'm still struggling. Good. It means the enemy has not overcome you. The fact that you are fighting, the fact that you have another day, the fact that you have another month, the fact that you have another year means that God is with you. God is helping you to fight. God is helping you to push through. Your God is with you. You should go home today and celebrate. Satan has not overcome you. Satan has tried to destroy you, but he has not destroyed you yet. The wisdom of God will grow in your life. Solutions will grow. The favor of God is growing in your life. You may think it's same old and same old and same old. No, I beg to differ with you. Some of you, have been, you, you, you are conditioned to coming to church. You're conditioned to raising your hands and singing. Some people are conditioned to say they can be fast asleep in church, yet say amen at the right places. They're conditioned to that. But we must not be conditioned because the issue is that with every day, every week, every month, we're growing in the favor of God. We're growing in the stature of God. Things are changing. You don't understand that. You may have been in church for 10, 15, 16 years, 20 years maybe. But you know what? With each day, each year that's going, the favor of God's growing on you. You're not in the same place. You've come a long way. And there's still a greater way to go. We should be shouting, give us our mountains. There's more territory to be taken. There's more victories waiting for us. Don't throw in the towel. Your struggle is proof that you have not been conquered yet. People have let us down, yes. Circumstances have let us down, yes. Things that we were depending on didn't work out the way we thought it would work out. But the fact that we're still in the struggle means that you have not been conquered. What you can tolerate or what you will tolerate will never change in your life. So we must come to a point where we'll never tolerate mediocrity. Never tolerate same old, same old. We must change. I don't like people saying to me, well, you know, I come from that church. And in that church, we did it like this. Yes, they did it like that 30 years ago. But change has taken place. We have another generation to reach. We have new technology given to us. We have to change our ideologies. We have to change the way we think. Say amen to that. We have young people growing up now. They're talking a different language. We have to also change our language so that we can communicate with them. And don't let the gap go too far. Say amen to that. We, how are we going to win the next generation if we separate our thinking from them? We're going to think like them. Say amen. Amen. And then influence them after we win them over. So we have to change. So what you will tolerate, you cannot change. And my last point is every relationship will feed a weakness or strength in you. So a relationship that you connected with, a relationship that you're involved with, will either feed a weakness or feed a strength. Therefore, select your friends. Select your friends. They may have the same title as you. They may live in the same area as you. They may have the same surname as you. But that doesn't mean to say to that you can be great buddies together. You have to separate yourself so that God can take you somewhere else. Remember what he said to Abraham. He said, come out from among them. And let me take you to a land, a greater land. And a land that I'll show you. But look at his instruction to Abraham. Come out from among them. Some of us, we have to come out from mediocrity. We have to come out from usual business as normal, business as usual. We have to come out of that so that we can think higher and think better, think bigger. Say amen to that. 
And so I just want to say this in conclusion to you, is your personality, uh, there is a gap between your dreams and where you are now, but if you will work and improve your personality, it will get you there quicker. You don't have to do the laps around the mountain again and again and again. That's the truth. The Bible says when Joseph was taken out of prison and brought before uh, the king of the land, he behaved himself wisely. He even dressed himself very wisely. That brought him favor. And he became the second ruler of the land. Here was an Israelite, a Jewish man in an Egyptian nation who was promoted just because he knew how to behave. He behaved himself wisely. I encourage you this morning as I conclude that you behave yourself wisely, improve your personality, and God will promote you again and again and again. Hallelujah. Clap your hands to the Lord. Give him praise. Hallelujah. I, I'm in a minute. Um, um, yeah, please don't stand in a minute. I'll ask you to stand. I'm going to hand over to Sia to say the grace and conclude the service. But I just want to pass my love and condolences to uh, the Pele family from Phoenix, uh, Bruce and Leanne, uh, on the passing away of their mum yesterday, Sister Priscilla Pele, who passed away and graduated to the Lord, and we conducted the funeral here. I want to thank all of our ushers and deacons at short notice. I gave you a call to come and assist and help us, and you did come. Thank you so much for coming and assisting us and being with us. Thank you for your support. We love you. We appreciate you. Have a wonderful day. And you can now stand to receive the grace. Thank you. Hey, hallelujah. Uh, thank you so much, Dad, for such a word. Amen. That was powerful. Amen. He first says, what you are willing to walk away from determines what will come to you. Oh, my God. Hallelujah. And it says our struggles are proof that we have not yet been conquered. I know I have not been conquered yet. I thank God for the battles I'm still fighting because it means I have not yet been conquered. Amen. Hallelujah. Just a quick one. Um, there's a music rehearsal on Monday, tomorrow, and on Friday there's youth uh, meeting. And on Sunday, sorry, on Thursday, we have live groups or cell groups in respective areas. Again, we use this to win souls and also to help one another grow. So if you don't know which cell group you want,